We're going to get started now, again. Uh, next up is Richard Manning. He is a prolific author and journalist specializing in agriculture, environment, and policy. Uh, he's done research and field work in over 30 countries. Um, unfortunately, his partner here for the talk, Dr. Rady, was unable to make it today. Uh, but please welcome Richard Manning. PowerPoint with a white hot passion, but I'm going to venture this far into technology and, and throw up one slide. I'm really not sure why. Um, this particular slide sort of haunted me through this whole process of writing a book, and that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you a book report on a book that's not out yet, which is a strange thing to do, but oh well. Um, but I found this slide in the early going, and, it, and, and the more I looked at it, the more I thought, if I unpack everything that's in this slide, then I'll have my book, if I can get there. And it turns out there's a lot more in this slide than I thought was there in the initial part of it, so my, my instincts were correct. However, I still don't think I've unpacked everything that's in it, but we'll get to where we went. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the genesis of the book because that helps explain why I think it's a good idea to talk to you about it today. Um, I'm writing the book with John Rady, and it will be out next year, uh, in April actually, from Little Brown, and it's going to be called Go Wild. Um, and the book came about through the weird backgrounds of John and I. We're separate partnerships. Um, I, I'm a journalist, and I hate to admit that in public, but it's true. Um, and um, I live in Montana. Um, I am a lifelong student of wilderness. I live in wilderness. I'm in it almost daily. Um, I, I hunt for elk and deer, and that's pretty much what I eat. And I'm a mountain runner and a writer. John is a psychiatrist. He teaches at Harvard Medical School. He's known for his work in um, cognition, mental health related to movement, how people move, especially with exercise. And I, ha I met him by accident. And I've been writing a lot about the kinds of things that you folks think a lot about, which is paleo nutrition, or nutrition as hunter-gatherers did it over the years, pre-agriculture. He writes a lot about movement and how it formed our bodies. And I said, you know, John, we're really writing about the same thing. And, and, and there are parallels here. So why don't we look at a bunch of other areas and see if we can find more parallels and see what lessons we can learn from human evolution that affect well-being. And that's what this is all about, about human well-being, how we get better as people. And we started out with a title, and it's the very title you have on the talk today in your program called Human 1.0, because our point was that the design was there in the beginning and we need to respect that design. Well, as often happens in publication, that title got changed. It got changed in an interesting way as I was writing about the topic. It occurred to me that I had written about this before, but I'd always written about it in terms of uh, um, re uh, resurrecting ecosystems ecosystem health, how we do ecological restoration. And if you think about this, what really happened here with agriculture 10,000 years ago was the domestication of humans. We always, always say that we domesticated wheat. Well, the fact is wheat domesticated us. And it made us very different. And it's a good way to think about it. And so what we ended up talking about here is rewilding in the European sense of rewilding a landscape. We're talking about rewilding humans and what that might look like if we claim our birthright through genetics and through um, our context with ecosystems to again achieve the kind of health that I think these people have. I think that's one of the things we're looking here. So as I thought about this picture, we thought about the obvious right away things that we think about all the time, the things we talk about, and that's, there's nothing wrong with beginning with the obvious, that these people are healthy, they're thin, they're lithe, and they're engaged, and, and that sort of thing seemed to indicate that we were on the right track with nutrition and movement, but what else could we write about? And we just spun off a list of topics. What else goes into this besides movement? Well, we right away thought about sleep. How do these people sleep? How can we say what goes on 
that was important for what for people today? What can we learn from sleep for our own well-being? And we, we thought about some other things. And oddly enough, this turned out to be very important. John told me it's only at the end of the process this was important to his thinking. But I told him something early on that when I'm hunting, my mind is in a very different place. My brain is different. And there's something about powers of observation and engagement that occurs only when I'm hunting that I think is really important. And I know this is true from stories from hunter-gatherers. A good friend of mine, uh, Richard Nelson, wrote about it with Koyukon people, for instance. And the, the analog I had for this was mindfulness. And it turns out there's a lot of research in, in mindfulness and what we think about through meditation and things like that. And it was the only thing I could think of. So, okay, we'll throw in a chapter on meditation, mindfulness, but that's from hunting. And then we thought, well, what about relationships? Those are important. And what about tribalism? Those things are important. So, okay, let's do a chapter on each of those. Note that I'm pulling these things out of the air almost right now, and that's kind of how we did it. We really didn't know. So sleep was really interesting, for instance, because we got about halfway through the process, and we started to panic. We said, good God, we got nothing on sleep. How do we fill out a chapter on that? Because we had pulled it out of the air, and we had sold the book already, and we promised this chapter on sleep. <coughs> But I, I spent an afternoon here at Emory, University with Carol Workman, and um, an afternoon with Robert Stickgold in Boston, who's a sleep researcher, and all of a sudden lights came on. And you know, that really was the process of this book, that it, 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 it went like hunting and gathering. And that we, it was a very much a process for discovery, that we trusted these things were there, and as we asked questions, they were there, not only meeting our expectations, but exceeding our expectations. And directed us in very different ways. So when we thought about sleep initially, we said, well, what prescription can we give people for sleeping drawn from evolution that will, that will tell them how they can sleep better? That's not where we ended up at all. Where we ended up was listening to the anthropology of sleep a little bit, the fact that people don't sleep alone, really never have. And it, that's true to this day in a lot of cultures in that we Westerners who do, um, Carol Workman calls this the, the lay down and die method, that if you go to sleep at night in a dark room alone, we're freaks for doing that. And the world over, people don't do that. And if you start peeling back layers of why that's true, you come back to predation and the fact that we were meat for a long time. And there were cave bears and lions living around us. And that's what we evolved with. Those were the conditions of our existence. And so the conditions of our safety and the conditions of, of, of our well-being depended on recognizing that and getting along with each, each other. And so Carol has, has calculated that, that a, with a group of 20 people, there's always somebody awake. And that was that social bond. And it ends up saying something like, Sleeping is a social activity. We don't think of it that way, but it is. That was a clue, that social activity question that kept coming up, and that, that idea of social kept coming up over and over again. We also ended up dealing with some paradoxes. And I love paradoxes. Anytime you've got a paradox or a dilemma, there's a book in there someplace. <laughs> right? There really is. And, and, and I don't resolve them, I celebrate. And, and, and kind of the bottom line paradox, the one we start in, are, are two conflicting statements. One is that every animal knows way more than you do. I got that from some Native American people to talk about that, and their respect for animals. What they mean that by that are instincts. Now, I boiled it down in the book to a very basic thing, and saying, you know, uh, I had a dog that had a litter of puppies one time. I was the nervous father and all of this, and I went on the internet and I researched and I knew every step I was supposed to perform. And there are very specific steps. I'm supposed to do these things when these pups are born. And I got this dog, and what does the dog know about this, right? Well, when the pups came along, the dog did all those steps that I've looked up on the internet and, and researched and written down and carefully learned. She did every one perfectly. Where did she learn that? Where did that come from? There were very specific mechanical steps. That's what they mean by every animal knows weight more than you do. And I, I use for this the model of, of, of this vision of Maasai people. I've spent time around, around Maasai people, and I think they're very interesting. Of these people moving across
across the desert, the grassland, in this wonderful gait with these gorgeous bodies and this perfect motion that is completely coupled to the place. And I think of how much we in modern society pay in terms of gym fees and diet books and everything we want to know to achieve that, and they do it, and they think it was silly to look it up the way that we look it up. That's what I mean by every animal knows way more than you do, and so do a lot of people. And that, what this really comes back to is recovering our instincts and becoming like animals. In some way, we know these things. That's one side of this. But the other side of this, and a side that I tend to disrespect in some ways over my career because I, I love biology and I love animals and I love ecosystems. And I don't think we're any better than any other animal. But there's always asserted in our, our tradition and in Western history especially that we are the crown of creation. That we are very different from other animals because of our behavior, because of our big brains, because of our abilities to dominate the planet. And why should that be a special deal, that crown of creation thing? But the more I went into evolutionary research, the more I understood it was true. It's absolutely true that we are the crown Creation, that our brains are very special instruments. There's nothing like them in evolution. Nothing like them in any other animal. There's nothing to match that complexity. And so you end up asking questions of, why is that? Where did that come from? And, and that's really what we want to ask in this book, in some way. And we ask it in a very special way. And one of the ways we ask it was, and this is the way that uh, 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 a lot of people are starting to ask this question. If we look at the hominid species, they, they were, you know, 40, 50, 60,000 years ago, there were about five species of hominids walking around that looked kind of like humans, upright apes, bipeds, smart as we are in a lot of ways, had the abilities with tools, had culture, a lot of the things that we recognize as uniquely human. Well, all those other species are dead, they're gone. We survived. Homo sapiens, the species that we are, survived. What happened there? How come they all went extinct and we didn't? Why did we outlast them? It's an incredibly important question, and it ended up being the question that drove a lot of what goes on. But the other question is, what ails us? I use an image in the book of a, of a, 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 that all of you have seen over and over again, way too often. I saw it yesterday. Being in an airport, okay? and in an airport, just looking across the mass of humanity, and you can do this any place, but I like airports because they're madness. And looking at the condition of our people today, okay, who are we as a people? Who are we as a culture? And the first thing you notice is obesity, and it's absolutely rampant. And it didn't look like that 20 years ago. It did not look like that. Our people did not look like that. Physically, they were not as saddled, they were not as immobile, they were not as sick. Our people are sick today. And if we think of the damage that's been done, not just to them, but children especially, with things like sugar, if we think about that damage, and some outside group had come in and inflicted that sort of damage on our people, we were saying we were under a terrorist attack. We've inflicted this on ourselves. What is this thing that ails us? Why are we sick? Well, it turns out there's actually a pretty good a bit of research that addresses that very question. What ails us today? Um, one of the things we did is look very closely at that and say, and, and the research is this. It says, what are the leading causes of death, but also debilitation? What is it that makes us not only die, but lose quality of life while we are alive? And the Gates Foundation did a study of this very thing. And they spent several million dollars, and the, research, the, the results are trickling out and will trickle out over the next three years or so. But it seemed like a pretty good baseline to us what we could start talking about what ails. And, they, and they, they listed in order of the 10, or I'm sorry, the top 12 risk factors for death and debilitation worldwide are these. High blood pressure, smoking, alcohol, household air pollution, low fruit consumption, high body mass index, high blood sugar, low body weight, ambient particulate matter, inactivity, 
high salt intake, and low nut and seed consumption. Low nut and seed consumption. You notice cancer wasn't on that list, the kind of thing we worry about. You notice there were no infectious diseases on that list, right? The kind of thing that medicine worries about a whole lot. But this is real. This is what people die of. This is what people are sick. And you can wrap these together very quickly with metabolic syndrome, right? what we're reading. But there's another way to wrap these together. These are all diseases of civilization, every single one. We're not sick, we're injured. We're injured by the way we live as a society. This is what is killing us. Diseases of civilization is an antique term. It arose in the 19th century, and people say, well, that's a nice little quaint area of study for anthropologists. What this says is it's front and center. It's the most important thing we can think of in human health. Diseases of civilization. In other words, the cost of our taming the fact that we have lost touch with the wild and we are now civilized is killing us. So that became our baseline in what we began to think about. Why is this true? And the obvious answer, of course, was metabolic syndrome and what we eat. But also things like lack of movement or sedentary weights, or stuff that you think about. I don't want to talk a lot today about the stuff you think about. It's not because it's wrong, you're right about that. We do talk a lot about it in the book. But you know about that. I want to try to push this out a little bit and push out into some newer areas because I think that's important. First thing I want to, and this is more an aside than anything else, is I came away from the book thinking, you know, there, there, there's some really some pretty interesting underreported topics out there. So in other words, nutrition is, is at this point, at least in the circles we work in, overreported. We thought a lot about that because it's the obvious. And, but, and it's not a bad thing that that's happened. We've examined that, and, and we've got a hold of something that's really important. I mean, if you could do one thing in this world tomorrow to make us all better, you'd ban sugar. It's that simple. It's that simple. And it's thinking like it's occurred into groups like this that that's happened. But let me, let me go to some, first of all, my nominations for underreported areas that I think we'll, we'll be talking about as much as we talk about nutrition today. Ten years from now, we're going to be talking about that much. One is you've probably heard of already, but let me stress it. It's a microbiome. What's going on in terms of our relationship and our internal ecosystems? And this one lights me up because um, I, I wrote a lot about ecosystem restoration before. Things like restoring prairie grasslands and what's involved in that. Well, it's exactly the same question in how we re restore our internal biome. And there's complexity there, and that's why I like it. It's, it's a really interesting question. There's nothing linear about it. It's not, not going to be straightforward, and it's going to make us appreciate the fact that we are connected in a very real way to the living world, what's around us, nature. And, it, and it's going to be humbling in some ways, but it's also going to be very important. We're going to get a handle on a lot of disease as a result of it. I mean, in considering diseases of civilization, we ended up separating them into two waves. And the kind of the first wave is the metabolic syndrome wave, the one we talk about in terms of, of cancers and high blood pressure and all that stuff. The kind of the second wave is the autoimmune diseases. And there's, there's, there's some pretty good work out now on people considering autoimmune disease and the hygiene hypothesis. And, and I think that that's going to be really important. We're going to think a lot more about it because autoimmune diseases really are a plague on us now, as bad as it is, metabolic syndrome. Second area that I think is underreported, we're going to do a lot more talking about, are uh, either micronutrients or phytonutrients. Um, the little chemicals or, or, or bits of nutrition that we get from plants through diversity, through eating a wide variety of foods. And almost all of nutrition science is concentrated on things like carbohydrates and protein few minerals, a few vitamins that we've named, but th there are hundreds of things out there that we'll end up talking about. And I've done a lot of um, research over the years in plant breeding, so I know what happened in terms of making rice white and how that was done, and making wheat grow with short roots and dwarf plants and how that was done. And what that ended up doing is robbing us of a whole lot of nutrition. So a beet is not a beet, right? Just like a because it depends on where it was grown. 
and it depends on the variety that was there and its ability to uptake certain nutrients from the soil. All of that's going to be really important. We're going to end up talking a lot more about that. Uh, Underreported areas that we're going to talk a lot more about epigenetics. Uh, we're way, way, way too far down the road on the gene hunt and trying to find the gene for this, that, and the other thing, when in fact that's kind of going to end up being a blind alley in some ways, or we put way too much faith in that idea just because we know how to do it. We're looking there because the light is there. But we will end up talking a lot more about epigenetics in the last next 10 years. Um, here's my personal favorite for underreported ideas in human evolution the important Music. Music is just vitally important. This morning um, I was listening to one presentation that listed music as, a, as an add-on and ornament kind of thing that we did and nobody and that's one view that's really prevalent in evolution there's actually a pretty good argument going on right now that says music predates language in evolution and we in fact built our abilities to understand language out of our ability to do music first and we'll find out that that ability of music to organize and um, enliven our intuitive brains, that's one of the things that makes us really good at what we do in survival. Um, that, that ability is going to become more prevalent. We're going to talk a lot more about that. These are asides. But I think that it's true, and, and, and one of the things we wanted to do with the book was to tease out areas that we could ask different questions and begin formulate questions differently, and music is one of them. But one of the interesting things that did happen in the research of the book is something we, we, we really hoped would happen, which was synergy. In other words, the way we think about these issues is that they are somehow separate, that sleep is separate from nutrition, is separate from movement, but we began in a very rudimentary, almost an initial way to ask the question, what happens if you get sleep right, get nutrition right, get movement right, and you're meditating and you're in nature a lot? You get all those things together, because that's how these people live. And it comes as a package, and it's complexity. And, and, and early on, we started to find some indications that those things were there, those connections were there. That some of the things that we thought as separate areas were turning out there are working along the same neural pathways, the same biochemical pathways. And, and for instance, here's my, one of my favorite examples is um, a test that psychologists do on people after a certain intervention with them. And the test is that um, they play a game. And we're going to give undergraduates money, and that's a big deal to give undergraduates money. And they test and see if they will give away that money to certain people under certain conditions. And if they don't give it away, they get to keep it. So you know, here's 20 bucks extra you got it in your pocket. You're an undergraduate, that's a big deal. So they use these volunteers. And so after certain interventions, it turns out people are more likely to give away that money. They're more altruistic, they're more generous with other people. Well, it turns out that in, um, People who meditate are trained to meditate and do, you know, a short session, two weeks training in meditation, give away that money. They're more likely to than they were at the start. But they, and then, then the same damn test shows up in things like um, being involved in nature. People do the same thing. They get, take a walk in the woods, come back, they get in that test, they give away more money. Same damn test. Same test with uh, chemical, and this is, uh, I'll get into this in a second, but we, we thought a lot about uh, oxytocin in, in the second. And if you give people oxytocin, which is a, a bonding chemical in humans, it's what keeps us together, they give away more money, more altruism. What's going on here? What's it, what is it about altruism that's showing up in the, all these separate areas and Meditating, you sit there and you think about nothing for a while, and then you get up and you give away more money. What's going on? Would these people do that? You bet they would. They give away that more money, we wouldn't have to give them the test. What that told us was that the more we get like our evolutionary conditions, the more altruistic we're likely to be. So 
we're likely to be thinner, healthier, not have heart disease. We're also likely to get along better with other people. All of a sudden, that lit up the idea of, of um, the social questions we were talking about. Let me back up just one second here, because there's one area I want to cover, um, which is John and I kind of had friendly disagreements as we were going on in this book. And one of the bets we had early on was um, that oxytocin would be the, John thought oxytocin would be the key word for the book. I thought it would be homeostasis. And we, so we tracked both of those things, and we're both wrong in one way. And, 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 but what we're wrong, and everybody know what homeostasis is? And it's that ability that if you get um, in a hot, your body, your body adjusts for, for um, changes. So in other words, you're short on oxygen, you breathe faster, and you get the oxygen. <coughs> homeostasis is a big deal. And it turns out there's something called allostasis, and that became a really important idea. Because homeostasis is too simple for what we do and, and what our bodies do for us. I'm sorry, you said I got five left on questions? Okay, I'm on my way. And so allostasis became really important, and, and to cut to the chase here, what that really told us was that this is why those separate areas, the areas we think of, rely on each other. So for instance, when, um, somebody who, who is, um, has a psychological problem shows up with stomach aches a lot. That's a real simplistic example. Somebody who's gone through a traumatic, traumatic experience has stomach aches. It turns out that your various systems borrow from each other. So there's a, there, there's a, um, a a system of barter almost mediated by the brain. And so it becomes pointless to talk about, as the medical model does, a single injury or a single cause because of what's going on in that incredibly fun, complex body of yours. That everything is tied to everything else in some really intriguing ways. Let me wrap up with one thing though. But the, the real surprise is the book and for me, was that I did not expect to be writing about social issues at all. I expected to be writing about health and eating and biology and stuff that I could grasp onto. But I had a conversation very early on with Dave Carrier. Dave Carrier, if you've read the book Born to Run, um, Dave was the guy who tried to kill an antelope by running it to death. He was a scientist who understood endurance running. And we talked about running, and. He said, well, you know, it's not about born to run anymore. He's doing research on who are actually born to throw and punch and do a lot of other things, and we're generalists. But right away, he wanted to talk about violence and egalitarianism. And we, we got to that, and that happened over and over and over again in the interviews. So that's where we ended up going. But it also happens to be research evolution at all. And we think we're going to get it right by eating a diet right or moving as, as gathered did, when in fact, what really made us human and what our brains were made for, those big brains that made us chronic creation, were those abilities, our mental abilities, to get along with each other, to do cooperation, and to be, to, to treat each other well, and especially to raise children well. And if there's a conclusion in the book, it's this, this is where we're failing as a species. That yes, these diseases or civilization are horrible, but what we are doing to our children today, where 25% of the children in the United States live in poverty, what we are doing there, and what we are doing with the unequal distribution of wealth in this country is destroying us. Because we are not equipped to deal with that, and it's incredibly damaging. Probably more damaging than sugar, and I never thought I'd say anything was more damaging than sugar. Um, I'm gonna wrap up with that and um, take questions because Cover way too much ground. Hi, I'm a clinical psychologist, and uh, we, I look at the picture and I, I look at the the connection that these people have to each other, and I think about uh, illness as you you know you were, were mentioning and how sick we're becoming with. Uh, just staring at our computers, and you know, I see it in my clients in terms of not being able to connect to each other, like couples that I work with, or uh, families that are so busy looking at their, their 
their iPads and their computers, that there's that, that loss of connection right there. And I think that that's a big piece of us not being as helpful as we could be. Yeah, yeah, you're seeing in this photo what I see in this photo. And especially, look at the animation and the guy who's doing the talking. Do we do, do we do that anymore? Does anyone do that? Can you get that out of an iPad or an iPhone or anything like that, that engagement? Or the warmth and the trust among those children? That's a big deal. That's a real big deal. It, I appreciate the analysis that you've given, but there is perhaps a corollary, and I wonder if you could comment on that, in that it might be considered a bit like the Fauvist movement. It might be a kind the of- The which movement? The, the, the Fauvists uh, in the early, where they kind of romanticized our more innocent past, the, the noble savage, as they called it. Yeah. And actually, if you look back uh, and you use um, archaeology and technology, you find that actually there were there was severe violence in many yeah. primitive tribes. There was, of course, cannibalism. There was incest. There were there was frequent and constant genocide. So I think it's important not to think that we all lived in Eden and we fallen because of an iPad. I think we must really state that. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's, that mirrors an active debate among the evolutionary people, the people, the paleoanthropologists who look at it. And, and, and there are two level, two ways of looking at that. And it's, it, of course, there was violence, and it's not violence is not something I shy away from in the book at all. That there should be violence, and so the oxytocin, that, that chemical they give us to bind us together, when they give it to, to male furry bulls, they get violent as hell, and they start because they're protecting you. So a lot of violence is protection, and there was violence in predation. So when the lions came in, and, you know, and, and there's some really interesting stuff in the literature about that. But and, and I followed that debate between anthropologists talking about this, and I came down on the side of the people who, who would spend their lives living with hunter gatherers, a lot of time with hunter gatherers, and they have. And there's something almost wistful about those people, invariably. And, and, and they and some of them are very explicit in saying. Look, anybody who says that they, these were basically violent people who spent their time killing each other, they're full of shit. These were nice people. We liked them. We liked living with them. And I, and I trust that. I trust that. So yeah, there's some romanticism in that, but I'm a romantic, so what am I going to do? So I, um, I work in public health in urban Philadelphia, and I work in a lot of underserved communities uh, that are really in impoverished environments. And do especially in impoverished situations and it turns out there are models for that in, in research with people like this and what went on and so it's always been true and there's a ratio to this that it takes four adults to raise one kid and so that requires what what the, what the anthropologists I like a lot Sarah Hurdy calls allo parenting and part of the reason we're such good social animals is women have to be able to recruit other women to help raise kids that's what goes on so if I were to talk about a first step for people who are impoverished in some way or in those communities, it's that you help out raise kids in some way. And, and generally, I've worked a lot of Indian reservations here in the United States where that's done with relatives. Where there's always an auntie who has a role in that child's life that in many cases rescues that child from, from bad outcomes. But then also protect those children from violence to the degree they can. And I know that that's really hard because that is the prevalent situation of, of those, those lives now. Those kids are in violence to a degree that we can't imagine and it's incredibly damaging. So what can we do to shield them from violence? And that's very important part of it. It's really unsettling when people I've interviewed and characters in the book show up to ask them questions. Oh, well, I showed up. <laughs> um, I was reacting a little bit to the issue about violence uh, earlier cultures, and um, there's there's a number of issues here. One of them is that yeah, there's been violence. There's been a lot of things that have gone back for tens of thousands of years. There were questions that came up this morning when when Melvin Connor was talking. Someone asked about 
the, the human relationships and the relational aspects, and he said there wouldn't be that much evidence. So it's easier to talk about the material supports of our organism. But that's, that's a relational <coughs> thing, and you were talking a lot about relational things. Yes. Um, one, of the, one of the figures in my own intellectual pantheon who I think should be a grandfather of paleo thinking that I never hear his name is, is Paul Shepard. Yeah. And he wrote Nature and Madness, which is every paragraph of that is worth most books. Yeah. And one of the things that he said is, he also wrote a bunch of other things, um, that there was, because I wrote my PhD dissertation years ago on evolutionary and learning theory before I went into being a brain scientist, I did that. And when I read Paul Shepard, I realized I was all wrong because we have this ideological idea that we're getting better through history, and of course everybody around here gets, has, uh, you know, they wouldn't be at this meeting if you didn't have that undermined in some way. But what Paul Shepard did was talk about how in paleo time, people had relationships with these other species, that everybody was deeply, deeply shaped by relationships with otherness who were other untamed species. And we start, when we started putting fences around things and putting animals in fences, the, the animals became dumb. And our relationships with them became dumb. And our, human, that our spiritual and intellectual differentiation became degraded. And uh, so that argument about sensibility seems to be incredibly important in whatever screw-ups we may have or whatever violence there may be, and a lot of, and one of the things that, that Shepard argued with a lot of detail was that cultures where there is more violence is in association with periods of ecological crisis and scarcity, and that the places where people had the privilege of living with more ecological abundance didn't have that problem as much. Or, so there's a lot of subtlety involved in this, and in terms of recultivating the relationships that's something that I think could be introduced into the argument in a very potent way. Yeah, yeah, and there are a couple ways that gets introduced, I mean, and also good on that is uh, Elizabeth Marshall Thomas. Mm -hmm. and her book on, she spent time with these people, her child among these people, and she talks about what Martha was just talking about is that relationship with other species. That there's a relationship, especially with lions, of respect and humility and they talk on that. But I also see that same thing expressed, and one of the things I think about in the book, what don't come to any conclusions, or big conclusions about, or the cave things, in places like Glasgow and Chauvet, and those caves in southern France, they're phenomenal. And they're phenomenal because they, they're not representative of the animals that were around there. In other words, they, they show really nasty animals a lot more than they do food animals, so lions and bears. But there's enormous respect for those animals that you see coming through in those drawings. You say, where did that come from? They had a relationship we don't understand. But the, the one, and the, the, the source I would really recommend to all of you in thinking about all this is a guy named Ian McGilchrist, who is writing about um, um, left brain, right brain stuff in ways that um, um, 20 years ago we talked about that and then it went away and now it's back, it's resurrecting it. And one of the things he talks about is the right brain having this ability to connect to the other, the right hemisphere, with, with a sense of um, awe and reverence and in ways that our left brain can't do and that our society has become so left brained as a result of civilization, what it's imposed on it, that this has dominated our thinking and we don't have the ability to respect what's around us. Um, well, the time Nazis, I mean. That's all the time we have. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 They're, go wild.